up to when Brian Crowe again, which is that I had no idea that Pitt and Tim was just down the road performing for Shed. Uh, so we are here, um, just on the outskirts of Creef, just off Brian Crowe, and um, right next door to the Strathlin Community Campus. Um, this was a development-led project uh, funded by Perth and Ross Council for the construction of a new primary school. Um, right next door to the high school. And before we started, it was a, a greenfield site. So that's the, you can see the, the, um, the high school on this side of the slide. Um, way back in 2012, uh, Perth and Kim Ross Heritage Trust uh, requested a programme of archaeological work beginning with a trial trenching evaluation. And that work led to the discovery of a small um, cremation cemetery, which we then excavated. And the post-excavation analysis on that phase, the 2012 phase, has now already been completed. Um, PKHT then also requested a watching brief during topsoil stripping um, during the construction works for the new primary school. There were areas that we couldn't trench at, at the time in 2012 because there was um, gas and water pipes running across the site, so there were buffer zones that we had to leave in place, which meant that there were certain areas that we hadn't been able to, um, to, to see. So the watch and brief um, happened while construction was happening, and um, we also uncovered another cemetery. Um, so this talk, my intention is to sort of pull together the 2012 results and some of the hot off the press 2014 results. We were on site from <coughs> April to about June, um, so not all that long ago. So yeah, we, we started the post-excavation uh, for the 2014 stuff. We literally have just started, so I don't have any results as yet particularly. Um, so, so you can see on this slide the, the locations of the two areas, 2012 and the 2014. And I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting, but you can see that there's a gas pipe and a water pipe kind of running alongside those two there. So this was the 2012 excavation, it was quite small in scale and um, it extended around evaluation trenches where we'd found some cremation urns. Um, so the excavation uncovered a small early Bronze Age cremation cemetery consisting of 19 individual pits, kind of natural. Um, here's the, the site plan. So that, the trench is about, I think it's about 20 metres by 20 metres, that's that sort of scale. So a pretty small trench. And um, out of the cremations, we've got these three, which were inside cordon urns, and a further six pits, which um, had cremation just placed inside the pit themselves without an urn. Um, so this mixture of urned and unearned cremations on the same cemetery is not unusual, although the reason why some people are buried in urns and, and some are not is not really clear. Um, the remaining pits have nothing in them, they're hard to explain. Um, it may be that plant truncation has removed the pit contents, or perhaps they had another function, which we don't really understand, but it wasn't for holding cremations. It has to do with the, the, the funerary rituals going on around the cremations, and um, possibly grave markers, that sort of thing. Um, or perhaps they're actually just a completely different day entirely, they may just be coincidence and they have nothing at all to do with the cemetery. And um, we actually, yeah, it's impossible to say. And um, there are also some rather nice finds. These red stars, um, some very nice finds of flint and bronze. And I'll talk a little bit about those um, later on. So the three cremation urns that we found, um, none of them were complete. You can see on this slide how shallow the, the surviving remains of the pit that the urn was sitting inside. Um, the, pit, the, the pots have lost their bases due to plant damage, so the rim of the, the vessel is, is down towards the bottom. The, pits are invert, the pots are inverted, so they're turned upside down before they're put inside the pit. Um, the, all the pots were cordoned bones, um, despite the fact that there was not very much of them left. So that's another example. You can see the two cordons on that one quite clearly running around the outside, but again, you can see at the edge of the slide, the depth of the top sort of covering the urns, and, um, and there's almost nothing left of the, of the pit that that pot was actually inside. Um, one of the pots, we've done the analysis on the cremated remains, these all had cremations inside them. 
Um, one of the pots contained two adults, possibly one female and one male. Um, another also contained two, two different people, a young adult and a juvenile, so that's probably the early teens. Um, and there were also some cremated bones from a young sheep or goat inside that pot with them. And the third urn actually <laughs> contained three different individuals, a mature male, a possible female adult, and a juvenile, and again some cremated bones from a, a young sheep or goat. I should say at this point actually that the um, cremated remains, they're not really the way that we think of cremations these days, um, you actually get quite large pieces of bone, so you can work out the, the gender of the person, the health, the age, all of those things that, that go along with it. Um, when I say possible female, possible male, it's obviously because the, the, the bones are, there's not enough diagnostic markers, and so you have to make assumptions based on the stature and the, and the size of the person. Um, so uh, the unearned cremations, the ones just in pits, they primarily contain just a single individual, um, both males and females represented, but one further multiple burial was, at, was identified on the site, which had as many as four different people in it, um, at least one adult male, and at least one child and one infant. Um, so that's quite unusual. Um, these are the drawings of the urns, rolled out so that you can see the decoration um, that goes around the pots. All geometric, incised and impressed cord patterns, very typical of this period, very typical of these kinds of vessels. Um, you can see only the upper part of the vessels survived. In each case, the whole rim circumference was there, but the, the lower body of the pot and the, the base had completely gone. So these urns would be expected to date between about 1900 BC and 1500 BC. Uh, Cordon urns are mainly found in Scotland and Ireland, and probably a distinct regional form with links to other types of early Bronze Age cremation vessels, such as um, collared urns. Um, but uh, uh, they're a separate tradition, even though a lot of decoration is very similar. Um, what was a surprise was when we lifted one of the urns out of the pit, and um, there's a copper alloy object was lying underneath. Um, this wasn't the only copper alloy object that we found. Um, the two more cremations in pits had um, copper alloy objects associated with them. So this one, this is it lying at the, the base of the pit. So it was probably at the top of the pot. Once the cremation had been put inside the pot, the um, copper alloy objects had been put in, and then the pot had been turned upside down, and that's why it's ended up underneath what effectively looked like underneath the urn at the base of the pit. Um, so these objects are these, once they've been conserved. Um, they're double-edged copper alloy razors, um, three of them in total. One of them was very damaged. The fat one on the slide is pretty much complete. The thin one has lost the outer edges of the blade. Um, they are tanned, so we've got that <coughs> tang at the bottom for a, a handle. Um, the rivet hole, you can see the rivet hole on the bottom there to attach to the handle. Um, no evidence of that or, or <coughs> handle surviving. Um, once they've been conserved, they're obviously when they first come out of the ground, they're, they're very dirty, it's very difficult to see any, um, any specifics. Um, but the, de the decoration on one of them could then be seen, and that's what the image is on the, on the right hand side. Um, incised lattice decoration all across both sides of it. Um, there was some possible um, hide, possible animal hide, and some possible textile which was um, stuck in the kind of an encrusted soily kind of mixture that was stuck to the blades of these things, and um, the, yeah, possibly from a sheath. Some kind of wrapping, possibly, you know, it may have been just been wrapped up before it had been deposited. Um, Alison Sheridan, who's no longer here with us today, um, she did all of the work on these on these bronze razors um, for us, so thanks to her. Um, and that's the drawings of them. Um, the razors, they hadn't been burnt, so they hadn't gone through the pyre with the body. Um, they were added into the grave afterwards. Um, and objects like this would have been prestigious items of personal grooming. Um, they could have been used like a razor, like we think of a razor today, um, or a small knife. Um, almost all of the razors found 
which date to the second millennium BC, have been found in funerary contexts, just like these ones at Broyk Road, and are most usually associated with cordon urns, which is the same as at Broyk Road, and usually with adult males. And again, that's the pattern that we see on this <coughs> site. Um, the importance of these particular races, the ones on the screen at the moment, is that we have reliable radiocarbon dates associated with them. Um, there are very few um, radiocarbon dates for any of the other examples that we know in Scotland. Um, because these are associated with cremations, we're actually able to date the, the cremated bone from those graves. Um, there are also some interesting finds, as I mentioned earlier, that from some of the other pits. Um, this was rather nice. The guys on site, when they, were, when they found this, were pretty excited. Um, so this is this is the multiple burial that I told you about, one with four individuals in it. Uh, and this group of flint arrowheads was just sort of tucked in with the with the cremated remains. So the, you can see the kind of white um, bone around it, which is the, the cremated bones. Um, and these are them. There is actually seven of them, um, and uh, basically buried in a small cache, a little, a little collection altogether. Uh, Flint Barton Town arrowheads. Again, they're not burnt, so they didn't go through the pyre with the body, uh, but were deliberately buried with these cremated remains. Um, the arrowheads, you can probably see, they're slightly different in size, um, and they're also slightly different in quality, the quality of the finish. And um, Anne Clark is our lithic specialist, and, uh, and she's of the opinion that they could actually have been made by three different people. There are sort of similarities between, you know, pairs or groups of them that, that suggest that there might be three different three different hands at work. Um, these sorts of deposits of arrowheads they are known from other cremation cemeteries containing urned cremations. So in itself, it's not it's not a, an unknown discovery. It's not an unusual find. But when you see them like that, it's very nice. They're, they're a really nice collection of objects. Um, there are also some other tools. Um, again inside this multiple um, cremation. So there's something about this particular group of individuals, these four people buried together, they have a lot of objects in there with them. Um, the other objects include this whetstone and um, a simple cobble tool which has just been bashed on one end. Um, so, uh, so for some reason this, this pit was particularly rich in artefacts. Um, why? I don't know. Uh, these are the ready carbon dates. Um, so these are from cremated human remains from the site. So they all fall between 1900 and 1500 BC. Quite a nice um, group and entirely as expected. But like I say, it adds to that corpus of information and um, gives, us, gives us extra security in the way that we um, date the, the particular the bronze razors. Um, so, on to the 2014 excavation, where another early Bronze Age cemetery was found. This time, as while construction is, is happening, the green cabins in the background are looking towards Bright Road. So we're sort of from, looking from the north um, down towards the road. There was time pressure, because this machinery, this everything else. This, the cemetery, this cemetery sits right under the footprint of the primary school. <laughs> Um, so it had to be excavated, there was no way of preserving it in situ, there was no way of, of leaving anything behind it, it was 100% excavated and the school is now on top of it. Um, so here's an overall shot, These, um, the square sort of pits with the, the wooden battens and the guy that's standing inside one of them, they're actually the, the pad foundations for the school building. Um, so they were working on the, on the foundations around us the whole time that we were there. Um, so this is the, this is the, the cemetery. Um, again, not a particularly large area, um, but quite a cluster of, of features and they've got an awful lot more going on in here. And it was sort of a roughly circular layout. Um, here's the site plan, and you can see that circularity comes out on the plan an awful lot better. That um, linear feature down at the bottom you'll be able to see, but that's a, that's a cultivation furrow from relics, ribbon furrow on the site, so um, no, no importance to, to what I'm going to talk about. Um, the main components within this cemetery, there's 
quite a lot of different things happening. We had this one, which is a single urned cremation. Um, we have five kists, stone kists. Um, and then surrounding the whole thing, we have these six large oval pits. Um, and these contain scattered cremated bone in them. Um, so there's, you know, there's an awful lot of an awful lot of human remains on this site. Um, and then a few other sort of smaller pits and, and smaller features. Um, some with cremations and some again without, some which are completely blank. Um, again we have a, a cordon dern. Um, this one is huge. <laughs> And again, the base is lost. Again, you're only seeing the top sort of six inches of the vessel. Um, the base is gone. Again, it's inverted. Um, this one is it's big. It's when they're when they're complete, you know, it's difficult enough moving them when they're into <coughs> that much depth. But the thing would have probably been about that round and would have stood to this kind of height. They're big, they're heavy. Um, so, uh, and again, decorated with, with geometric um, patterns around the top. Post excavation has just started, as I said, uh, so I can't tell you anything about the individuals found in there, um, but we are currently sieving soil samples and we have excavated the urns as well. Um, so here's Christina in our lab, um, you can see the cremated bone inside the, the pot there. And um, we found this, this thing that's inside the pot. And it's a whetstone um, with a perforation at one end. And it doesn't appear to have been used in any way. It almost looked brand new. Um, doesn't hasn't got any damage or chips or anything like that on it. It's, it's an extremely nice object. And again, not burnt, um, but it's been tucked inside the pot along with the, the cremated remains from when it was, when it was buried. Um, we've got five stone built kists. Um, I'll just very quickly, I'm just going to kind of run through all of those and give you a, give you a view of, of what they all look like. Um, this one didn't have any capstone surviving and had been power damaged along one side of it. One of the, one of the side slabs had gone. So you can see that third, fourth side of the, of the kist, there's no, there's no side slab there, that's actually power damaged. Um, there was a deposit of cremated bone in here, uh, but no finds of any kind at all. Uh, our second kist had a large capstone in place, this kind of trapezoidal shaped stone on the top. Um, and inside was this very nice pot. Um, again, cremated bone inside the kist itself. Very little cremated bone inside the pot. This is, again has been has been excavated in the lab. Um, nothing particularly. Um, a few scraps of cremated bone inside inside the pot, but it hasn't it hasn't formed a receptacle. It's not it's not been used for the cremated bone. It's simply been put in the kist alongside it. Um, nothing else. No other finds in there at the moment. Um, I mean, stuff may come out of the soil samples. Um, we don't know that yet. Um, this pot is a food vessel, um, so it's slightly earlier in date than the cordon derns, um, as Alison was, was talking about this morning. So I'd expect this to date to kind of 2200 to about 1900 BC, so very slightly earlier than the, the cordon derns. Um, the third kist didn't really look like a kist initially, it was just this big stone. And in a lot of other situations you wouldn't really particularly think twice about it because we, had, we knew we had kists. Um, we obviously had to lift that capstone. Um, and underneath again was another kist. And this had two episodes of de deposition inside. I don't think the kist was reopened and stuff was put in. I think it was deliberately that there were two, two deposits um, put inside that kist. Um, there, were, there was cremated bone at the bottom, then this layer of cobbles, which is shown on this slide, and then more cremated bone put on top of that. Um, so it'll be really interesting to find out who these individuals are, if they're, if it's, again, if it's, if it's the same person, for whatever reason, divided in half and separated, or if it's two different people, three different people, we don't know at the moment, but it could be a number of different individuals in there. Um, fourth kiss, again, we weren't really expecting this to be a kiss at all. 
and it just it looked like a stone filled pit. It didn't really look like anything else. Um, it looked like you know the the oval pits around the outside. It didn't really look any different from any of those. Um, but again, once the upper stones were removed, um, this had an absolutely massive capstone in there, gigantic capstone, uh, very nice, very circular pit. Um, and on this slide, you can just see the, the side slabs of the kist underneath. Um, so obviously, we had to get mechanical help to remove that because it was flipping huge. Um, there was a void underneath. Um, so the kist underneath wasn't completely full of soil, there was, there was fresh air in there when we lifted the, the capstone. Um, and, uh, and again, this stone-lined kist underneath. Um, inside this one again, there was another pot. So uh, this one was a bit squashed, it's not complete unlike the other one. Uh, all the pieces are there, but it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it was broken in situ, in, inside. The kist, um, and again, it's a it's a food vessel, another another food vessel, and again, um, cremated human remains inside the kist, but not inside the pot, um, but no other no other finds in there with it, and then the final kist is the most spectacular of them, and uh, this one is <coughs> roughly in the middle of the cemetery, um, again it was from the surface it was a kind of a large stony pit. <coughs> No capstone visible on the surface. You remove that prime, that first deposit, and then um, came down to this, uh, this another massive capstone. Uh, these the rendering rods in that photograph are a meter long, so it's it's over a meter in length and about a, a meter wide. Um, sitting on a layer of flat stones, um, so we removed the capstone. So you have this layer of, of flat stones. Once these flat stones were removed, there was another capstone underneath, and that gives you an idea of the scale of the guy there um, removing part of that capstone. Um, and so again, obviously, we removed the cap that capstone, and um, and again there was a void, and you can see under his feet. That's literally us lifting the, the parts of that capstone which was which was broken, and there was just a void. Underneath again, nothing, no soil, no, no infilling of any kind, and it was immediately obvious that there was cremated bone sitting on the bottom of the kist. Um, so there it was, this quite a large deposit of, of cremated bone sitting at the bottom of that kist, and that's it's literally that's that's how it was left. You know, the, because there was no soil infilling, um, it's very much a kind of a, it's a bit of a, a tooth and car moon moment when you have peel back the lid and suddenly this, you know, it's exactly as it was left, um, what we're talking about, three and a half thousand years ago. Uh, so incredibly exciting, really, really interesting. It sort of looked like there was two piles of bone. Um, there, there's a slight sort of hint of separation into two piles. Um, so we're, again, once we know who these individuals are, and I'm assuming there's more than one in here. Again, it may not be, but I'm kind of assuming. All oh, right, okay, goodness. Uh, so this is rather, um, yeah, so that just gives you an idea of the, of the size and scale of that kist. Pretty huge. Um, very briefly, we'll go back to our site plan. That one in red is that central massive kist, and the, the four in yellow are the other kists. These are the stony um, pits. And we've also got this one, which was full of charred, um, charcoal burnt material, uh, fire cracked stones, lots of charcoal in there. So it possibly re represents the remains of um, pyre debris, something like that. Um, the blue pits, they have an upper stony fill, and in some cases that appeared to look like, so this is one of those um, pits outlined in blue, and they have this kind of almost like a cairn on top of them. Um, several of them were actually upstanding to 20 centimetres, 40 centimetres, they hadn't been ploughed flat. Um, so we kind of suspect that these were actually some kind of marker and would have been, would have been visible. Um, these large pits did contain sort of scattered cremated bone, and we've also got various pies, we've got some flint, we've got some stone tools, that sort of thing has come out of those. Very quickly, just to put it into context, just to flag up where we are in the world. Um, 
So we've got CFA site uh, right next door under the Strathland Community Campus. Sue App did an excavation in 2007 um, of part of the, the Broich Cursus. That red area is the scheduled monument which contains the, the majority of the cursus. You've got all kinds of things in the vicinity, lots of Neolithic ritual and funerary monuments. Um, obviously, we're talking about the Bronze Age, but I think what it demonstrates is that this kind of part of Creef, the outskirts of Creef, was an important centre for all kinds of ritual and funerary activity over many, many, many hundreds of years. Um, it's even possible that the Neolithic Cursus was still visible in the landscape during the Bronze Age, and that you know it, it attracted burial activities um, because of that. Um, so, pit pot or pissed is the question. Um, the answer is, who knows why the choices are made. Um, clearly, some people are buried in pots, some people are buried in pits, some people are buried in kists. They have different types of objects associated with them. What that all means is, is kind of impossible to say. We have adult males, adult females, we have juveniles, we have children. There is no pattern as to, you know, certain types of people seem to be buried in certain types of ways. It, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of, of, um, of burial practices. And, uh, I mean, more information from, from this site will come through post-excavation, so we'll know who they are, you know, the age, the sex, um, their health. Uh, but um, other than that, yeah, it's kind of hard to know. Um, the kinds of Promotion activities that are going on, uh, you've got pyro goods, you've got grave goods, I'm wrapping up. Uh, so some of the objects will, will have gone to the pyre with the, with the person, so you've got, um, in, in the 2012 stuff, you've got a certain amount of sheep and goat bones which have been burnt and possibly perform part of some kind of feasting ritual. We've got other clean, new objects which are placed into the graves. Um, what is the meaning of all this? Who knows? Bronze raises themselves for interesting high status. And again, like Alison was saying this morning, there's indication of wide links. These people have access to resources, they have access to raw materials, they have trading links, they're not isolated in the world, and they have a fantastically complex, um, full and rich ritual life that manifests itself in the archaeological record in the, uh, in the burial monuments that we can see. Thank you very much.